My research focuses on education for disaster risk reduction and resilience with children and young people and predominantly with schools. So looking at how we can design, implement and evaluate education programs that really support children and young people to be able to understand the risks in their community, identify problems and then take action to solve those problems. And I guess my research is very concerned with how do we support children's genuine participation in those processes. So very much about giving children power in decision making, about what they think is important, what matters to them in their lives. And yeah, and, and our role as adults, as teachers, as emergency service agencies is to support them to become active participants in disaster risk reduction in their communities. And we can do that really effectively through education. The relationship between schools or the education sector more broadly and the emergency services, I think traditionally has been one where the emergency services have come in and delivered uh, you know, like a 45 minute session where the kids have learned, you know, I mean, the classic example is for house fire education where the children are learning about stop, drop and roll and get down low and go, go, go and house fire escape plans and things like that. And I think for the, yeah, for, for, for decades, that's been the model um, or for kind of, you know, this kind of safety education in schools. Um, but when we start to talk about natural hazards like bushfire and flood and cyclone, it gets a little bit more complicated and there's actually a much more involved process of learning that the children need to go to go through. So it's been a real challenge, I think, for the emergency services to be able to effectively address those more complex topics of natural hazards and disasters with the really quite limited resources that they have for school education. So I think the relationship between fire, you know, emergency service agencies and the education sector has been that the emergency services have tended to focus on providing learning materials, so lesson plans and, you know, sometimes, you know, still a school visit. But I think what we're starting to see now is, um, is kind of a democratisation of that relationship where schools and the education sector are becoming equal partners in that. And that's fantastic because the emergency services know risk and risk management and teachers and the education sector know education. So by coming together and actually partnering on, on projects for DRR education, I think that's going to move things forward quite quickly now. Teaching is a very high pressure job and I think that's where we need to probably work a lot harder to make teachers feel really supported and make sure that, that we do the, the hard work for them so that they can deliver something in collaboration with local partners. Um, but that we really share that load it, and, you know, to talk about shared responsibility, this shouldn't be solely the responsibility of teachers because, first of all, we know that children actually want to engage with experts. That's something that they tell us time and time again. They really want that personalised uh, dialogue with local experts um, in emergency management. But also, yeah, just to provide that support to teachers, I think, is really important. And I think the other barrier is that the educational benefits of DRR education are only really starting to be recognised. And our research found that when children are engaged in learning experience that are place-based, that are participatory, that do involve those local partnerships, you know, that they are quite community-based, the the learning, you know, the, the, the learning outcomes and the personal development outcomes for the students are quite extraordinary because it's something that they really engage in. I think the most up-to-date learning and, and the direction that things are really moving in now for disaster risk reduction based on the international research and policy 
is a real move towards those place-based participatory approaches. And when we talk about place-based approaches, we're really talking about embedding the children's education, educational experience in place, in their town, in their community, in their natural environment, and actually using that place as the, you know, the, the learning laboratory, if you like. So rather than children sitting, you know, learning things from textbooks or worksheets, they're actually going out into their environment, into their community, talking to people, interviewing people, um, you know, observing what's happening in, in the natural environment. And that's where we see really positive outcomes, not just in terms of the children's engagement, but in terms of their understanding of risk because risk is a place-based phenomenon. We know that it's the combination of hazard, vulnerability, exposure and capacity and those things are different in every place and I think that's one of the problems that, that we've really noticed with traditional approaches to DRR education is that you know we were kind of looking for this one-size-fits-all you know, approach or this kind of silver bullet that would, you know, suit every child. Whereas I think now we're looking much more at models that can actually be embedded in the local community because that's where we see the best outcomes, not just in terms of the children's knowledge and skills, but in terms of tangible reductions in risk. So I think one of the things that we're working really hard on is to start incorporating the international science on disaster risk into the design of DRR education curriculum. So it's not about starting with a bushfire plan anymore. It's about starting with the natural process, how bushfires behave, how they interact with the natural environment. Then it's about looking at the potential for that natural process to become a hazard. And then looking at what is exposure? <laughs> Who is exposed to that hazard? How do we assess exposure? Vulnerability, what, you know, what people place, what people, property um, and assets in those exposed locations are vulnerable or susceptible to hazard impacts. And then capacity, what can communities do? What can individuals do to actually take action to reduce those risks? What knowledge, skills, resources do we have um, at hand to, to do something to increase community safety? 10 years ago, we weren't talking about disaster risk reduction education for children in those terms. It was really just about trying to get them to do the things that the agencies see as important, you know, for emergency response, whereas I think now we're actually really engaging children as um, citizen scientists in their own communities and the things they notice, the things they observe, the things that they come up with are really fantastic because they're experts in their local household schools and communities and when we actually provide them with that technical framework for understanding risk, um, they will take their own knowledge of, of how their households, communities and schools work in reality and find achievable, feasible solutions. So I think the days of simply telling children to go home and make a bushfire plan are gone. We know it doesn't work. We know that they need to become really invested in that activity and they become really invested by being positioned as experts. And that's where the education is so important. I think one of the most important things agencies need to know in terms of past and current approaches is that simply giving children information is not only ineffective, but actually undermines the outcomes that we're looking for. And this is because children aren't blank slates. They come into disaster risk reduction education and into dialogue about, you know, bushfire, flood, whatever hazard it might be, with a whole world of theories about how that hazard interacts with 
the things that we value as communities. So, you know, for example, we tell, you know, if we tell a child to fill up a bath um, in preparation for, for a bushfire, they will think that they're filling up the bath to prevent the fire from coming into the house because their understanding of bushfire behaviour is that bushfire travels in a very linear, predictable way via direct flame contact around, along the ground and a non-flammable barrier will stop that fire from coming through. So when we work on a kind of key messages basis where we're delivering key messages to children without any opportunity for the children to really understand the concepts and the processes um, involved, the potential for them to misinterpret information or you know, have existing misconceptions reinforced is huge and it defeats the whole, the whole purpose. So I think whilst we know that information dissemination doesn't inspire the kinds of action from children that we're looking for, we also know that in a lot of cases it can actually do more harm than good. It's going to require that agencies really start to embrace that idea that children are members of the community. They are amongst the most vulnerable members of the community when it comes to hazards and disasters, but they also have that capacity to contribute in really important ways. So I think there's actually a cultural shift that needs to take place within the agencies. And that's starting to happen. Agencies are, I mean, we're seeing it at you know, high level policies. We see it in the Sendai framework where children are recognised as agents of change for disaster risk reduction and are actually, and the Sendai framework also requires governments to involve children and young people as active participants in the development of policies, plans and procedures. So Australia is a signatory to the Sendai framework. So, you know, we have that really high level policy, which is fantastic, but we need to start seeing that filtered down through to the federal and state level. Then I think it's a real exercise in building capacity. So building the knowledge and skills of agency staff and volunteers to be able to engage in these kinds of programs that actually do require handing over quite a lot of power to, to schools and to children, which can be really challenging for emergency management staff and volunteers who are very probably a lot more comfortable with, you know, a command and control structure. So I think really, um, yeah, some, yeah, building the capacity in agencies for people to be able to do this kind of work. So I think we need to support the development of relationships between schools and emergency services at the local level. And, but also we actually need higher level collaboration between the emergency services agencies and, and government and the education department um, so that we can start to find the common ground where we can actually be addressing the shared goals of education departments and emergency services. And they do exist, school emergency management planning being just one of them. You know, the education department has uh, a responsibility to ensure that, that schools have plans for natural hazard and disaster events and the emergency services are responsible for responding to those events and also responsible for you know, community education. So we can actually find those sweet spots where you know, different sectors have those shared goals. And I think that's a potentially really prom promising path forward.